Um, great, thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. We are going to get started. So the purpose of today's hearing is to provide a brief overview for the city's 2023 operating budget and then to review the um, department-specific budgets for finance and management, education, and recreation and parks. This year, council will be reviewing the proposed operating budget through an equity and inclusion lens. In 2020, council created an internal racial equity collaborative to further our mission of creating a more equitable city. We believe that equity will give all residents access to the full breadth of opportunities available in Columbus. As part of that work, we, uh, at our racial equity collaborative began examining areas where we could be more intentional about inserting equity into our processes, including how we budget. As part of this year's budget process, we will include that in how we address um, and analyze what our departments are doing to incorporate and consider equity initiatives in the budgeting process. So before we get to department-specific um, presentations, I want to start things off with our guru on all things budgeting and finance, um, hearing an overview of city revenue projections from Auditor Kilgore. Auditor Kilgore, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Finance Chair Hello. Brown. It's good to see you. I'm feeling a little sentimental because I feel like um, when I came into office, there were so many things that I was looking forward to being able to accomplish, and we've done so together, which is pretty incredible. Um, so I'll start today with just some general comments. Um, for a true deeper dive, I encourage everyone to take a read through the city's 2023 revenue estimate. It is a full deep dive into what we're anticipating for next year. But um, many of you know um, my incredible predecessor who was here for just shy of 50 years. And there was one thing he never had to contend with, which was a pandemic. And in addition to um, the pandemic, you know, I framed it in the revenue estimate as we've never had many countervailing or counteracting forces. We had, for example, a pandemic force shut down, followed by the highest level of wage inflation our city has ever seen, where most sectors experienced double-digit increases. That, of course, immediately impacted our income tax, which is our bread and butter here. Um, but it's a, it's a contrast, a pandemic shut down and then incredible wage inflation. We had supply chain limitations, uh, you know, in addition to, um, in some sectors, a complete halting. Um, in the midst of what was an unprecedented level of federal stimulus. And you have not just the federal monies, but you also have, in Columbus alone, we received 2.5 billion, billion with a B, um, in PPP loans. And that went to about 31,000 um, individual businesses. And for example, you know, in the midst of all of that, some of those businesses were able to grow, of course, while others were forced to shut down. Um, so, you know, that's when I, when I phrase it as countervailing, it's really an understatement. This has been um, an incredible couple of years. And um, whilst a new partner in Director Kathy Owens, certainly the team is not a new partner. And we've all been in the same boat of uncertainty. Um, and the good news is we're pulling back the layers a little bit where we do have more certainty today. Uh, I definitely anticipate that 2023 will um, confirm some of the resilience of our community. There are certain sectors who are going to be more, um, you know, at risk for some of the, the downturn that we're all anticipating. And just this past Monday, uh, the federal announced, the Fed announced that there's going to be another set of rate, at least a rate hike, um, singular, if not more. And so as we look into 2023, we do anticipate still some um, bumps, uh, both from direct consequences of the national economy, as well as some, let's say, indirect. And what I mean indirect is the fact that some businesses have been able to flourish as a result of the federal stimulus. As that goes away, we are anticipating changes to what degree we're just simply, we don't know yet. Um, remote work has stabilized a bit, which is a good thing. That was very volatile at first, especially in 2021 for the city of Columbus and into this year. Um, now it's stabilizing a little bit and what an incredible um, 
source of, I guess, you know, unease because, as you know, 80% of our revenues come from income tax. Anytime remote work uh, was being factored in, we really had to put on um, a different level of, of, frankly, analytical thinking. In addition to the typical analysis about new jobs or labor trends, we also had to start thinking about how people are working and what is that level of sustainability. And we, we do feel a little bit more comfortable um, than we did even a few months ago. Locally, um, employment continues to find big boosts in certain areas, while others are um, maybe a little bit more um, cautiously optimistic, waiting out a little bit of these bumps. Um, but we will certainly keep on that into 2023. Um, and the last item just worth noting is that there is still the possibility the Ohio Supreme Court has to hear this. Um, it was the Cincinnati tax case. Um, you'll remember, Chair, that the city of Columbus's case was determined not to be heard by the Supreme Court of Ohio. They did accept the Cincinnati case as such. Um, that's why you know, we featured income tax refunds due to remote work as still being a questionable item pertinent only to 2020. Um, so if any of one listening or in the audience would like to learn more about any of those items I just you know, spoke to, the 23 revenue estimate is a deep dive. Um, we do uh, a significant um, you know, kind of a historical as well as current information. But short story from October 21st when we published the revenue estimate to today, we are trending just a little bit better than what we anticipated, although every day that seems to go down a little bit. So I do believe we're going to end the year pretty darn close to where the revenue estimate had us. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Auditor Kilgore. Um, it has definitely been um, a turbulent couple years for understanding uh, revenue and budgeting in our city. And so I really appreciate your steady leadership as well as the steady leadership of our finance department. And I am taking with me um, a catchphrase from what Auditor Kilgore just said, which is that 2023 will confirm the resiliency of our community. I love that as a budgeting principle in terms of revenue projections, but I like that as a goal for all of us in the, in the um, policy and budgeting work that we do. Um, moving forward, um, or that y'all do moving forward, I suppose. Um, <laughs> so let's um, move along uh, now to uh, finance and management. Um, Director Kathy Owens is present to provide a brief overview of the proposed budget for the City of Columbus, followed up by a review of the Finance and Management Department um, budget by Adam Robbins. So we will start with Director Owens. Good afternoon, President Pro Tem Brown. Um, on behalf of Mayor Andrew J. Genther, I'd like to thank you for having the opportunity um, to present his proposed 2023 operating budget, as well as to uh, take a dive into the Department of Finance and Management's uh, actual budget. Um, I'm not going to be doing that. That's going to be done by uh, our financial uh, administrator, Adam Robbins. So I'm going to turn it over to Adam. Good afternoon, President Pro Tem Brown. On behalf of the administration, I'm pleased to present the mayor's proposed 2023 operating budget. I will present a general overview of the budget, followed by specific comments on the Department of Finance and Management's budget. This is a $2.3 billion operating budget, of which slightly more than half, or $1.144 billion, is for the operation of general fund divisions. The majority of my remarks will be related to the general fund operating budget. First, I'd like to discuss the resources for the general fund. By far the most important revenue source of the city, income tax was projected to decline negative 6.83% in 2022. After five strong months of growth, the auditor revised the 2022 official revenue estimate to 3% in June of this year. Then in October, when building the estimate for 2023, the auditor used a 4% growth factor for 2022. The city auditor's 2023 estimate for income tax growth is at 3%, or $831.6 million. This figure represents 79% of general fund revenue, or 73% of total general fund resources. Other general fund revenue sources are also expected to experience solid growth in 2023, including property taxes, which are expected to grow 3.5% over 2022 receipts. Local government funds are projected to grow 5.2% in 2023. Because of rising interest rates, investment earnings should bring in $25.3 million next year, 
or an increase of $15.2 million over 2022 receipts. Another large source of revenue, charges for services, are expected to grow by 4.2% in 2023. Also, the carryover amount is projected at $81 million, and this amount includes $45.5 million in third quarter review savings, mostly due to using $30 million in ARPA revenue loss replacement to offset general fund expenditures. No transfer will be needed from the basic city services fund, and approximately $2.5 million will be transferred in from the council's reimagined safety subfund. Now on to the expenditures, or the budget. The operating budget funds all of the personnel, goods, and services that are necessary to deliver essential services to our citizens. Approximately 70% of the general fund budget funds personnel. The 2023 general fund budget is 10.3% higher than the 2022 original budget as amended by Council, and 13.8% higher than the 2022, 2022 third quarter projection. This is a continuation budget that focuses on the safety of our citizens, the quality of life in our neighborhoods, continued fiscal responsibility, and the future of our young people. Safety continues to be a top priority with $707.3 million in general fund resources devoted to the Department of Public Safety. This funding level represents 61.8% of all general fund resources dedicated to operations. This budget includes funds to hire 170 new police officers and 25 lateral transfers. After 90 projected retirements, the city will add a total of 105 police officers in 2023. The budget also includes hiring 125 new firefighters. After 60 projected separations, a total of 65 additional firefighters will be added in 2023. The budget continues to fund the Comprehensive Neighborhood Safety Strategy Program at $18.9 million and the Right Response Program at $3.5 million. A total of $10 million is budgeted for development social service grants up from $5 million funded in previous years. We continue our direct investment in the education of our children. The proposed budget allocates $8.9 million for the Office of Education's Early Start Program, including $3.1 million for the new Hilltop Early Learning Center, serving a total of 1,240 children in 2023. Assistant Director Adams is here to discuss more details of education's budget shortly. In public service in 2023, Refuse's $17.8 million in tipping fees will be moved from the Special Income Tax Fund into the General Fund. Also, Columbus households will begin to re receive recycling services on a weekly basis next year. And a $2.2 million expansion is included to battle illegal dumping by adding solid waste inspectors and two convenience centers for drop-offs. Director Reese and her team are here today to discuss the Recreation and Parks Department's 23 budget. The collective commitment to the city's long-term fiscal health has again resulted in the maintenance of our AAA bond rating. We continue to be the only city of our size to receive the highest rating from all three rating agencies. The mayor's proposed 2023 budget sets a new goal for our rainy day fund. 10% of the 2023 budget, or 114.4 million, by the end of 2027. After a $2.75 million deposit and interest into the fund next year, we project to end 2023 with a balance of $95.2 million, which will keep us on our schedule to meet our new goal. Meeting this commitment will ensure financial stability for the city well into the future. At this time, there are no plans to utilize any dollars from the Basic City Services Fund, and so the year-end 2023 balance is projected at $49.7 million. In our 27 pay period, a reserve fund established to prepare for those fiscal years in which there are 27 pay dates rather than the standard 26, We'll end 2023 with a balance of $11.6 million. I would now like to, like to quickly address the Finance and Management Department's budget. Our 2023 budget is a maintenance budget. The proposed budget, including all funds, is $187.9 million, and it supports 313 full-time and 11 part-time positions. The general fund represents slightly over $118.7 million of that total. The Facilities Management Division is the largest general fund division with a budget totaling $20.2 million, including $6.1 million for utility expenses. The Fleet Management Division's proposed budget is $44.4 million, and it supports 133 full-time and two part-time positions. Fleet is an internal service division that bills other departments for the services it provides. The division is responsible for the repair and maintenance of approximately 2,978 on-road and 3,150 off-road pieces of equipment essential to the delivery of city services. 
Within the division, $11 million is budgeted for fuel to power the city's fleet. As has been noted in previous budget discussions, the Finance and Mansion Department's budget includes significant general fund resources <coughs> that although budgeted within our department, benefit other general fund agencies. This includes $26.9 million for citywide technology billings, $16 million for economic development incentive payments, and $19.6 million in, dollars in hotel motel tax fund disbursements. The finance citywide account is budgeted at $60.3 million and includes deposits of $2.75 million and $2.9 million into the rainy day fund and 27th pay period fund, respectively. I would like to thank the mayor for his leadership, Arthur Kilgore for her guidance, as well as Finance Committee Chair Brown and Vice Chair Bankston for their partnership. And finally, I'd like to thank the Finance and Management Department's budget staff, as well as the fiscal staff of all the other city departments who helped put together the proposed 2023 operating budget. Thank you, that concludes my testimony and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I do wanna ask um, whether it's um, to you or to Director Owens, I, I know um, the mayor talks a lot about equity and has um, what he calls his equity agenda, which covers all departments, really, all across the city. Um, so that's a lot for you to answer for in one short question, and I don't expect you to be able to do that, but I do want to explicitly ask if you could help us, Director Owens, in understanding how the operating budget in broad strokes works to increase racial equity, um, whether it's in within your department and how that runs or that the broad strokes from um, across the, the city budgets. Sure, President Pro Tem Brown. Um, I'm gonna let uh, Deputy Director Chris Long speak on that. Um, he has done um, some work in that area um, now and under the leadership of the former Finance Director, Joe Lombardi. Um, we might not be able to ask, answer all of your questions, but we can answer some of them. And if there's additional um, questions that we can't answer, we, we will definitely get back to you. So, Chris. Good afternoon, President Pro Tem Brown. Um, as you mentioned, uh, the mayor launched earlier this year the Opportunity Rising Initiative, which is an extension of, of his equity agenda. And that is really the lens through which the 2023 operating budget was developed, both at the macro level and at the micro level within the departments. And it's structured around three main pillars, um, which are safe and resilient communities, uh, health and well-being of residents, and economic stability, not only of city operations, but of uh, individual neighborhoods and residents who live in those neighborhoods. Um, each department will talk specifically about how their departments and their budgets address those issues, but some of the major initiatives that this uh, budget incorporates uh, would be, for instance, the creation of an official Office of Violence Prevention. Um, this uh, next year's budget sets aside $4 million for the creation of that uh, office. That will oversee all um, a comprehensive unified approach to violence prevention in our communities and will be across departments. Um, uh, as, as Adam mentioned, um, there's additional uh, investment in personnel for police and fire. So just a few things um, on the safe and re resilient communities pillar. Um, in terms of health and well-being, um, as Adam mentioned, there's uh, additional dollars set aside for comprehensive neighborhood safety strategy as well as the right response program. Um, those programs cross uh, health as well as division of fire. Uh, development uh, will receive additional dollars for their human services programming um, and of course they'll be uh, eager to talk about those initiatives and in terms of economic stability um, again as Adam mentioned um, this budget uh, restores our basic city services fund um, and sets a new rainy day um, fund set aside goal of 114 million dollars um, to uh, ensure the future economic stability of the city. As Otter Kilgore has mentioned several times, um, there's still a lot of financial uncertainty out there about remote work and what that means for future uh, income tax revenues. Uh, so uh, very happy to answer any other questions you might have on that. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, one of the things I'll highlight for those who are 
um, uh, watching now um, live or um, later on YouTube, one of the things I'll highlight is that um, each department has specific equity objectives too. So I know that Education and Rec and Parks here today will talk through theirs. And I, I'm, I believe that to be the case um, for each of my colleagues uh, for their budget hearings that they're holding. Um, so definitely we're going to continue um, to, to focus department by department and how we are um, not just um, trying to you know, level the playing field, but also specifically take an equity-based approach um, um, to, to thriving for all families in Columbus. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I don't have any further questions for finance, so I'm going to move along to um, the education department. So we will hear an overview of the Office of Education's um, uh, uh, budgeting priorities uh, from Assistant Director Sierra Adams. So Assistant Director Adams, thank you for being here. Um, and uh, without further ado, the floor is yours to talk about education. A lot of exciting stuff happening in education this year, I'm going to say. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, President Pro Tem Brown. Um, I appreciate you giving us the opportunity to present the 2020, 2023 budget for the Office of Education. Um, our mission is to enable all Columbus children to succeed in Columbus's vibrant and growing economy and to develop into a highly skilled, creative, entrepreneurial workforce that will propel economic growth in the 21st century. We thank you for giving us the tools and the support that we need to carry out these, uh, these, this mission. Um, our total proposed appropriation for the Office of Education is $13,269,490. The majority of this funding, um, $10.2 is for the Early Start Columbus initiative. Early Start Columbus is our pre-kindergarten uh, expansion program that provides direct support for our pre-K slots and professional service contracts and consultant fees. Uh, because we know that quality is crucial for kindergarten readiness, Early Start Columbus rewards providers with increased funding as they increase the quality of their programs. Our goal is to serve 1,000 Columbus children each year, but each year, costs, each year of our costs are reaching, our goals, goals they go up. Uh, because of this, our quality incentives, they're actually working. Um, now, the majority of the providers with whom we work with are five-star um, providers within the uh, Ohio Step Up to Quality um, Improvement System. The states, um, excuse me, and therefore they received our highest rate. Through this program and with our support, we are provided, we have provided over seven to five hundred uh, Columbus children with a life-changing early education over the last eight years. And we now know that this program is successful because of the, for the first time ever last year, we were able to uh, see how well our children did on the KRA. And the KRA, um, for those who don't know, is a, a high predictor of the third grade reading success of these students. And, um, and their actual lifetime achievement. Um, in addition, we um, have requested uh, 3.1 million in Early Start Columbus funding to support the, the enrollment of 240 Columbus children in the new Hilltop Early Learning Center. The Hilltop Early Learning Center is a whole family support model that gives families access to the highest quality pre-K programming on-site on health care from Nationwide Children's Hospital, food security resources, counseling, and the center will provide routine preventive care, physicals, immunizations, mental health services, amongst other things. Um, the center's education partners are going to be CDC, the Childhood League, Columbus City Schools, Sprout 5, and the YMCA of Central Ohio. They're all coming together to provide children with education and care to prepare them for kindergarten. Two programs that help us collect this important data that I mentioned before and analyze the results are C-Hive and Ready for Success. 
Seahive is our data platform that collects the student-centered data that teachers need to make important instructional decisions and provides early warning indicators that helps teachers determine if children need additional assistance. Um, in 2023, again, we are requesting $186,000 to support this important tool. We are requesting $400,000 for Ready for Success. Ready for Success is conducted by the Crane Center at Ohio State University, which provides pre- and post-student assessments, classroom observations, and teacher coaching. Thanks to our partners at Ohio State, we've been able to identify struggling students early, and we've, we've been able to provide them the extra assistance they need to increase their progress. One of the many things that we've learned from the, from the pandemic is that there is a significant importance in after-school programming, um, especially on the mental health and development of our children and youth. Um, in after-school programs, our students receive not only social and academic programming, but mental health counseling, social-emotional supports, case management, and a good meal. And through another partner, Partnership for Success, um, our after-school providers are able to identify those early warning signs as well. And they indicate that a student is struggling in their home, in their school, or in their community. In 2023, we are requesting $2,389,000 which includes the continuation of funding to support our existing 19 after-school providers. And in addition, the city has developed a after-school program model um, in partnership with community organizations to provide middle school youth the access to quality evidence-based um, after-school opportunities that meet their needs and support their health development and education. $400,000 of our budget will be used to support Future Ready Columbus, our education-focused public-private partnership. With our support, Future Ready has developed a birth to five strategic plan for Franklin County, and this plan with drivers of children and families, health and behavioral health, high-quality education and development supports, and public and private infrastructure was introduced last year with widespread community support and collaboration. And to support our small team, we have requested $582,000, I'm sorry, $582,904 for the administration of our office. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, Chair Brown, um, and your team for your continuous support. As I said before, um, this is your support and your guidance. It, it re really means the, the world to me and Matt, um, and we couldn't have done it without you. Thank you so much, Assistant Director Adams. Um, I appreciate the overview of the budget, um, the glimpse into the really crucial work that, um, that you and uh, Matt are doing. And um, I would like to ask you to zero in on some of those most important outcomes as it relates to racial equity. <coughs> Um, in the work that you do. Um, could you talk about how that is, um, you know, how those goals are expressed in your budget and then those outcomes that you, that you strive for as a department when it relates to racial equity? So the most important outcomes that we are making sure that we are providing funding for those um, children that are at, at most risk um, in the community. Um, we work with partners um, that, with some great partners um, to close those educational gaps that we know very well exist. Um, by addressing those disparities, we are able to align high quality programming with better prepared teachers um, through our um, partnerships with Ohio State. They're providing <clears throat> diversity, equity, inclusion training for those teachers um, and <clears throat> excuse me, and other professional development and ongoing coaching. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that um, I will add in just observing the work over the years, um, how important the 
um, the focus the department has on cl closing um, the racial disparities when it comes to KRA scores. Um, we know that um, uh, that that the the earliest assessment we do of kids, they're entering kindergarten, and already we are seeing gaps um, in how what skills children are bringing with them into those you know big elementary school doors when they walk in. And that's the importance of early childhood education. So just really embedded in the work you do is addressing those gaps. It is addressing racial disparity. Um, and it's important to point out that those gaps don't happen by accident. Right. Our babies are resourced differently from the start, whether they're born into a low-income household or high-income household, um, uh, the, you know, what their neighborhoods are like and opportunities are like from those very earliest moments. Um, those don't happen by accident. Those are choices that have been made um, really by all of us, by our community. Mm -hmm. We have to take ownership for those choices that are then um, manifesting in those early experiences of our youngest people. And in order to correct those choices and um, in order to, to make it level, going from here out, we are investing to get kids ready for kindergarten right. so that everyone enters those doors equally. Um, so it's really baked into the work that you do, and I appreciate that. And I want to point out that that's the bread and butter of, of um, the work that I know our education office does. But also, as you're looking at these middle school, after school opportunities, there's a racial equity piece there, too, because we want to make sure that every kid um, uh, has opportunities after school to be in these evidence-based programs that propel that learning forward. Right. If we're going to level the, the playing field before a kid gets into school, we want to continue that throughout. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next thing I'll point out is the hard work that the Office of Education has done on Columbus Promise. Um, and we've really fo you've really focused in on how to make sure that there are equity outcomes when it comes to the Columbus Pro Promise program. Um, and I won't try to recite your data because I know I'll mess it up, but I am impressed um, with, with how um, at the end of high school, the Promise program is addressing the racial disparity gaps that many of those kids were saddled with at the beginning of their schooling period. So um, thank you for the daily work the office does in that arena. Thank you. Um, all right, I don't have any further questions. Um, I, I do wanna note one thing I noticed in the budget proposal is just that um, uh, the, the numbers obviously for the Hilltop Early Learning Center have increased this year and it's not readily apparent to someone reading the budget that is because the request for Hilltop for 22 was only for the latter half of the year, whereas the request going forward is for a full year's operation. So I will just underline that for anyone who's um, trying to piece through the budget on their own. <laughs> um, all right, thank you so much. Um, next, we will hear an overview of the proposed Recreation and Parks Department budget, um, a big one and an important one. Um, we will hear from Elaine Hostetler and Director Bernita Reese. I will turn it over to, to you all. I don't know if we're, if we're starting directly with you, Ms. Hostetler, but I will first hand the floor to Director Reese to do as she pleases. <laughs> okay. um, yes, I'll, I'll be starting out. Good afternoon, President Pro Temp Brown, Auditor Kilgore. Uh, my name is Elaine Hostetler. I'm the Fiscal Manager for Recreation and Parks, um, and I'll be presenting the 2023 budget request for the Recreation and Parks Department. I wanted to start out with a quick description of the Rec and Parks Department. Um, Recreation and Parks Department's mission is to connect the people of our community through the power of nature, wellness, and creativity. With more than 400 parks, 28 community centers, five athletic complexes, six golf courses, and 230 miles of regional trails, the department serves roughly 1.7 million residents throughout central Ohio and relies on the support of nearly 9,000 volunteers. As the largest summer food provider in the state of Ohio, the department provided over 217,000 meals hosted 98 produce markets, and provided produce to more than 3,100 households in 2022. The department's vision is to ensure every resident has access to all its many services. With this mission and vision, along with the objectives set forth in the 2019 through 2024 strategic plan, 
The Recreation and Parks Department programs and services are critical to ensuring Columbus remains America's opportunity city. If I could have the first slide. Oh, do you have the, there we go. Um, for the 2023 budget year, we are requesting a total budget of $65,215,636. The budget will fund the 27 programs housed within the Recreation and Parks Department. And this is an 11% increase over our 2022 original budget. The components funding the 2023 budget are the following. A general fund transfer target amount of $50,449,636. Projected revenues for the department of $13,866,000. Projected encumbrance cancellations of $900,000. And our request also includes a 5% vacancy credit of $2,380,738. The proposed 2023 budget will provide $47,975,460 in personnel expenses. This is a 15% increase over 2022, which will fund 415 full-time and 1,418 part-time authorized positions. $3,103,306 will go towards materials and supplies. This is a 14% increase over last year due to supply over this year due to supply increases across the board and particularly large increases in the cost of lawn and pool chemicals. $13,785,631 will support service service needs for the department. Uh, this is an increase of 20% over 2022, largely due to increases in bus transportation costs, utilities, fleet, and portable toilet rental fees. $168,750 will fund other expenses in object class 05, and $182,489 will provide matching funds for COAAA grants. Our full-time personnel numbers have risen over the past year to a total of 50 positions over the original 2022 budgeted full-time strength for recreation and parks. Our increased numbers of full-time staff include the following. 21 approved positions added over the course of the past 12 months to address expanding needs in technology, sports field management, park maintenance, recreation management, capital and construction projects, and the aquatics program. These positions have been funded in 2023 within our budget allocation. Additionally, 22 part-time positions, positions were moved to full-time in an effort to improve retention and attract qualified candidates. These positions have been funded with a reallocation of funds from our part-time budget to our full-time budget, resulting in a reduction of 62 authorized part-time positions. And lastly, seven full-time positions are requested as expansions to our 2023 budget, including four forestry crew positions and two positions dedicated to the management of PAL, the Police Athletic League, which is an existing program that will be operated by the Recreation and Parks Department with volunteers coming from safety. Um, our 2023 budget includes expansions totaling $3,070,697. And these expansions include $1.5 million to bring 630 part-time positions up to a minimum wage of $15 per hour and $500,000 to bring a portion of lifeguards to a wage of $17 per hour, ensuring that we're able to compete with suburban pools for lifeguards, which are essential to our aquatics and summer pool program. We are also requesting expansion funding of 300,000 for the APPS Job Readiness Program, 180,000 for the APPS Teen Impact Program, 130,000 for community relations and development efforts, and as previously mentioned, 245,000 for the forestry program 
and 216,000 for the PAL program. I'd like to mention a few of our uh, many different programs, opportunities, and outdoor spaces that are important to the residents of City of Columbus. Some of the highlighted programming, opportunity spaces, and items of importance are the following. The total requested funding for the 2023 APPS Youth Development Program is $2,536,741. This program enriches the lives of youth and young adults ages 14 to 23 by connecting them to services and programs focused on building life skills, character development, jobs, post-secondary education, and other components. The department will continue the Center Without Walls program, which began serving residents in the Wedgwood area and expanded in 2020 and 2021 to now serve six Columbus neighborhoods. This programming provides much needed after school as well as other recreational opportunities for, its res for the residents. Go Lunch, the largest free summer meal program in Ohio is sponsored by the Columbus Recreation and Parks Department, which responded to need by working with community partners to share free meal resources, including free mobile produce markets, the department is committed to providing meals in 2023 and would like to serve over a quarter million meals as well as continue to partner with organizations to assure access to fresh produce year round in Columbus communities. The therapeutic and outdoor recreation programs will continue to expand their programming inside the department's 28 recreation centers. Therapeutic recreation offers inclusion support for participants with disabilities to participate alongside their peers in summer camps and other programs while continuing to provide unique, adaptive, after-school and recreational programming as well. Outdoor recreation will continue to expand programming inside recreation centers in an effort to introduce all Columbus neighborhoods to boating, fishing, archery, hiking, and exploring the natural world. An additional 300,000 has been allocated to expand the Jobs Readiness Summer Program in order to offer the program year round, September through May. This year round portion of the program includes part-time employment and job skills training to teens and young adults employed by the APPS Reroute Program, which focuses on violence interruption. As we navigate the post-pandemic world, the department anticipates continuing to implement opportunities for the community to celebrate, network, and enjoy the uplifting and diverse events offered by the city. For 2023, support for the city's signature events will continue, including the Jazz and Rib Fest, Rhythm on the River, Winterfest, and the new Seabus Soul Fest, inaugurated this year. The Recreation and Parks Department will add two full-time and one part-time position in 2023 in order to oversee the youth sports leagues in conjunction with the Police Athletic League, PAL. These positions will be responsible for police volunteer recruitment, training, and staffing of PAL coaches. They will assist in fostering new relationships and building trust within individual communities. And lastly, the Franklin Park Conservatory will receive $350,000 and the King Arts Complex will receive $125,000 in continued city support in 2023. I'd now like to invite Director Reese to provide a review of the forestry program and our equity framework 1.0. Thank you, Elaine. As you all see, we have several things that are going on within our department. Um, CRPD invests heavily in conserving the community's natural environment. The department manages roughly around 14,000 acre, acres of parkland, 28 nature preserves, and 34 pollinator gardens. The department continues the implementation of the Urban Forestry Master Plan to prioritize, preserve, and grow the city's tree canopy. The Urban Forestry Master Plan consists of an expansion request over the next six to seven years. The total combined funding for forestry and the Urban Forestry Master Plan is 
$485. Our department currently has a maintenance program that would enable us to prune trees every 30 years. So we are behind. However, with this expansion funding of 245,000, this will allow us to create a four additional crew, one supervisor and three other personnel to assist with pruning, removals, and nursery support to staff the address, pre and post planting rec requirements. The national best practice for pruning is every seven to eight years. Once again, we are at 30 years, but the national best practice is at seven to eight years, which cities such as Charlotte, Portland, Minneapolis, and San Francisco currently have. As we begin to look at the equity of our park system, we have developed a map of tree equity throughout the city of Columbus. This is to ensure that we are planning equitably around the city. This is a true story as you view the map. That map consists of where our low density areas are, as well as where we're currently growing in a success. So when you look at the low numbers, it's all of our gray areas and our high pink numbers, which are very close to the burgundy, are our high uh, areas where we have actually tree canopies. So we've got some work to do. As we look at an increase in our budget as a department, we've been focused on equity. This has been something that we focused on, not just this year, but for quite some time. We created our equity framework earlier this year when we conducted our commissioner's retreat. We are focused on our printed materials, website, and staffing that looks like our community. Our most important outcomes as it relates to racial equity are health and wellness, economic impact, active transit, and climate resiliency. Our history dated back to the 1960s here in the city of Columbus as the highway cut through the city neighborhoods and separated the park systems. Today, Columbus Recreation and Parks continues to map, address, reduce barriers, and develop neighborhood amenities. Our goals are, are documented in five areas, trailway expansions, citywide opportunities, community relation initiatives, programming and community needs, and standardized maintenance. To ensure that we incorporate equity, we will analyze factors to include data such as demographic patterns, vulnerability indicators, crime frequency, geographic distribution, survey results, operational spending prior to capital investments by geographical locations. This concludes our budget presentation and we're asking any, we'll answer any questions at this time. Thank you so much to both of you for your presentations. Um, there's a lot of really good work happening in the department. Um, and I also appreciate, I, I heard a lot of innovative ideas on um, staff attraction and staff retention. I know that that has been an ongoing challenge for um, across the economy, but particularly um, in the department because of the really people forward work that we do. Um, so thank you for that innovation and um, working towards solutions um, so that we can get into that stronger position um, in all the services we offer through the department. Um, I did want to ask you to zero in a bit on, and there was so much to pick up on the, the presentation, but if you could help folks who are listening and um, council members who may review this at a later date to zero in on some of the ways that your operating budget increases racial equity um, within your department and within the community. One of the things that we do, we do believe in looking like our community that we serve. And so we are uh, very aggressively uh, going out to Latino, Hispanic job fairs. We are uh, printing in newspapers that are not just the dispatch, but also amongst uh, different communities 
Um, and that is with uh, language barriers that we probably don't have within our community. So just finding different unique ways of how do we reach individuals that um, we serve within our community so that our staffing in our community not just um, looks like uh, one central uh, population, but it looks like the various, uh, I would say, ethnic ethnicities that we have throughout the city. Absolutely, and each of your departments, or sorry, each of your centers functions in its own little microclimate, right? And like, who attends those centers? Who feels welcome in those centers? All that has to do with um, the folks who are welcoming them, welcoming them into the doors oftentimes, right? So thank you for that approach. Thank you. You know, um, we're also looking at how we, uh, our commission board and diversifying it. So it starts at the high level. Um, but it works its way throughout our entire department, making sure that we are a makeup of our community. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I don't have any further questions for the department. Um, so I appreciate the presentation today. Um, and the hard work really happened before today, obviously, for months, um, putting together your operating budget request. And um, so I appreciate you being here today to present it. Thank you. I would like to say, uh, President Pro Tem, it has been a pleasure uh, with you serving as our chair over our department. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say that your dedication um, to our department and to the city of Columbus, we appreciate everything that you've done. Uh, we look forward to working with you uh, in a different uh, uh, level uh, in your new position. And so um, thank you and best wishes to you. Well, thank you. Now that my other departments have left chambers, I can say you're my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, well, we didn't receive any speaker slips for today's hearing. Um, so anyone who would like to comment on the budget can contact my office at any time. Um, and there will be many additional opportunities for comment at our remaining hearings. So this was the, only the second hearing um, held, which means there are five more to come. Um, let's see if I'm counting this correctly. There are, yes, there are five more to come. So Wednesday, December 7th at 3 o'clock p.m., Council Member Remy will host a hearing of the Public Safety, Environment, and Administration Committees to provide written or in-person or virtual testimony. Um, email Lucy Frank at ljfrank at columbus.gov by noon that day. Uh, then on Wednesday, December 7th at 5 p.m., Councilmember Rob Dorans will host a hearing of the Public Utilities, Workforce Development, and Building and Zoning Policy Committees. Um, on Thursday, December 8th at 5 p.m., Councilmember Shayla Favor will host a hearing of the Housing, Health, and Human Services, or excuse me, of the Housing, Health, and Human Services, and Criminal Justice and Judiciary Committees. Got to get my commas right on these committee names here. Um, then Tuesday, December 13th, will be our final budget hearing at 5 p.m., hosted by Councilmember Lord Esperoso de Padilla. She will have a hearing of the Neighborhoods and Immigrant, Refugee, and Migrant Affairs, Public Service and Transportation, and Veterans and Senior Affairs Committees. Um, and... As in years past, we do expect that final consideration of the operating budget will occur late January or early February. Um, I will not be here at that time, as has been alluded by, um, by folks today. I um, will be stepping off council at the end of the year to start um, as the president and CEO of the YWCA Columbus. I know the budget will be in great hands with my colleagues, and I appreciate having been able to take it this far um, under the wise leadership of our departments and, of course, of our auditor. Um, so with that, we will conclude today's hearing. Thank you all very much.